When you think of hackers, what comes to mind? Is it an isolated man working in a dark basement surrounded by screens and random lines of code that looks like the Matrix? Maybe he's wearing a Guy Fawkes mask. Or is it an island hopping millionaire with connections that span the globe? For over a decade, the hacker Roman Seleznev, aka NCUX, aka Track2, aka Tupac, went on an online crime spree that paid off tens of millions of dollars from credit card fraud. Roman lived outrageously and flaunted his stolen wealth on everything from muscle cars to tropical vacations. He built a criminal empire from the tragedy of his youth, and once he tasted that sweet, sweet life, he wouldn't or maybe couldn't give it up for anybody. And that is the arrogance that blinded him to one simple rule of internet crime. Always change your password. This is the story of the criminal life of Roman Seleznev. Going back to the beginning, we don't know much about the early life of the Russian national. He was born in 1984, his parents divorced at an early age, and he lived with his mother after the separation. They settled into a small apartment in Vladivostok with four other families. As a kid, Roman developed a talent for working with computers, although it's unknown how he developed this gift. It's also hard to exactly pinpoint where things began to turn in his mind. Maybe these humble beginnings in this cramped tiny home made him long for the extravagance that would define his adult years, or maybe it was the impending tragedy that would forever change him. You see, in 2001, when he was only 17 years old, Roman found his mother dead in the bathtub. She died alone in a porcelain grave from alcohol poisoning. Without a father in his life, Roman was now left alone, and it wasn't long until he was living on the streets. In this desperation, he turned to the only skills that could keep him alive. According to Roman, his life of crime started the same way it ended, through credit card fraud, identity theft, and of course hacking. Although the details of these crimes aren't public, he made enough money to catch the attention of other criminals. Which raises a question, was Roman already living a flashy lifestyle that made these criminals pay attention, or did he hack the wrong person? Roman never clarified, so I guess we'll never know. But shortly after his criminal activities began, a group of thugs invaded his home and tortured him for money. After surviving this horrible experience, he vowed never to hack for money again. But it's of course hard to keep these empty promises when you have Roman skills and bills to pay. With an experience that should have turned him into a law-abiding citizen, it was actually just the beginning of his villain arc. Roman was about to take his first steps from a small-time criminal into a prolific mastermind. In 2002, Roman reinvented himself under the name NCUX, and became ingrained in the underground carding world. This crime isn't as innocent as the name sounds. Carding involves taking stolen credit cards to buy prepaid or gift cards. The thief, or the carder as they're called, sells the card or the information to other thieves online so they can buy whatever they want or just take the cash. Some even flip the goods they buy to make a further profit and of course launder the money. This type of fraud is most common in the United States since many people use their debit or credit card for purchases, making them more accessible. But how do hackers actually get this information? Well, the security of many stores and websites credit card processing systems isn't exactly airtight, although it's of course been getting better over time. Still, determined hackers could and can find weaknesses in the system to access every card swiped or entered. Roman began trading in full-blown identity theft, selling off his victims' names, dates of birth, and even social security numbers. But this wasn't an easy process. It took him time to collect this data, and Roman wanted a scheme that would earn faster with far less effort. So in 2005, he went all in on credit card fraud, becoming a major player on Carding World and Card Planet, which sound exactly like what they are. Essentially forums that acted like the eBay of criminal fraud and profited from stolen data for years. But nothing ever happens in a vacuum, and soon Roman's volume of sales got the attention of the United States Secret Service. You might think the Secret Service only guards high-value political targets like the President, but according to their website, quote, Special agents focus on protecting top US and visiting foreign officials and investigating financial crimes. This group protects money just as feverishly as they protect anyone in office. 
unlike Roman's ventures, gathering data to make a criminal case wasn't quick. Thorough investigations take time, so for almost four years, the Secret Service watched NCOX's movements until they had enough to suspect his true identity and location in Vladivostok, Roman's hometown. Agents gathered their evidence and, along with the FBI, approached Russian security agency, the FSB. But just one month after these agencies began their talks, something interesting happened. NCUX announced his retirement from carding on the forums. Just like that, Roman pulled the plug on his very lucrative operation. So the question would be asked, why now? According to chat messages the government later intercepted, Roman had contacts within the FSB. These contacts tipped him off about the investigation, and then he just closed up shop, deleted his accounts on the forums, and just as quickly as he exploded onto the scene, he was gone, vanished. But of course, he wasn't going to go and start living an average life, was he? So what would he do next? An important thing to note here is that in Russian, NCUX is pronounced SIH, which translates to psycho. Roman was known as a quick-tempered thug, and his name defined his persona online and in real life. It definitely fed his growing ego. After all, the Secret Service couldn't arrest him, the FBI couldn't find him, and someone in the Russian government had his back. So even though he swore off the life publicly, again, there was no way he was going to stop. He'd barely scratched the surface of his potential. So later that year, Roman re-emerged even bigger and better onto the scene, now operating under the name Track 2 and Bulba on Carda SU. In his previous iteration, he was selling credit card numbers, just like a private vendor would sell trinkets on Etsy. But now, with the years of experience Roman had under his belt, he would scale his operation into a full-fledged business. Now he was the Amazon of credit card theft. Roman was given the sacred status of a trusted vendor on Carda.su on his very first day, and the website would even kick out other vendors in his favour, giving him a virtual monopoly on fraud. Of course, the brazen nature of this website and others like it means it is constantly under federal surveillance. The feds didn't know who Track 2 was, but they assumed that no amateur could get this preferred treatment unless they had the volume of stolen data to back it up. And once again, Roman found himself in the sights of the Secret Service. As the agents began to unknowingly pursue Roman again, he began his reign of terror across the United States. But how exactly was he stealing data this time? Roman was now targeting small businesses and restaurants through their point-of-sale card terminals. He would hack the systems and install malware that would read the information on the magnetic strips on each credit card. Two layers on that strip contain your banking information, Track 1 and Track 2, which is exactly why he called himself Track 2. Roman was so arrogant, he was naming himself after the methods by which he was stealing the data. The Secret Service, of course, wasn't the only agency to notice something wrong. In 2010, an e-crime task force became aware of a hack into the point-of-sale system in Schlotsky's Deli in Idaho. The group sent in Detective David Dunn to investigate the matter. While digging deep into their electronic records, the detective discovered that the deli had sent customers credit card data to a server in Russia. The system was so poorly run that the numbers were saved as unsecured text files. Lousy data management made restaurants like these easy pickings for vultures like Roman. Dunn found the weakness of the system. He knew where the data went, but he didn't know who was behind it, and there wasn't much evidence left behind. That, however, would soon change. A different suspect was apprehended in a separate matter in Ohio by the Secret Service, and on that suspect's laptop, were the hundreds, if not thousands, of credit card numbers taken from the same deli in Idaho. Knowing he was working on this case, the agency contacted Dunn and asked him to get involved. Dunn examined an image of the suspect's laptop and found two sites of interest, track2.name and bulba.cc. The suspect dumped the credit cards onto these sites. Now the detective had something to work with, and the two sites looked surprisingly similar. Was this the same person running them both? Poring over saved chat messages, Dunn found the suspect was talking to Track 2. In their chats, Track 2 directed the suspect to upload to Bulba and not, in his words, his other website. There was the answer. He had a handle. Now he needed the real name. 
Dunn began requesting for warrants to give him the authority to hunt down the mysterious Track 2, but that process takes time, because in reality, justice is anything but swift. While the detective sniffed at the trail, Roman was of course expanding his empire. Less than a month later, another spike in fraud hit, this time in Detective Dunn's backyard of Seattle. He returned home and visited the new crime scene, the Broadway Grill. When he ran forensics on the system of the Seattle restaurant, Dunn found that over 32,000 credit card numbers stored in plain text were transmitted to the exact same websites. Dunn applied for even more warrants in his district as a result. He was searching frantically for any emails linked to the website's registration. This search led him to a Hop1 server in McLean, Virginia. This, while a small thing, was actually the break he needed. He set up a pen trap on the server, allowing him to see who was logging onto the website and their location. What he found was staggering. Hundreds of restaurants nationwide were connected to the site, almost all running the exact same point of sale system that Track 2 so easily hacked. What started with two mom and pop places quickly escalated into dozens upon dozens of other establishments, which meant hundreds of thousands of victims. But let's go back to Roman for a moment. While the authorities may have been onto his game, they still had no idea who Track 2 was. And as his underground network was growing, he was beginning to take luxury vacations to private island resorts. He even bought himself and his new family a second home in Indonesia. Yes, now Roman was a committed family man with a wife and daughter and an addiction to muscle cars, entirely funded from fraud. This hacker wasn't hoarding his wealth, he was living the high life off of other people's misery. Roman had dragged himself out of poverty entirely through keystrokes and a modem, but he wasn't content to just get by anymore. Now he had a lifestyle that depended on his criminal empire growing even further. But when your operation depends on you spinning plates, it's only a matter of time until gravity sends one crashing down. And when you're dealing with the federal US government, one is all you need. Back in Seattle, Dunn was dissecting the infrastructure bit by bit. The Hop1 server he found had over 400,000 credit cards stored on it, all sorted by the victim's IP addresses. The investigation also revealed a Yahoo email address that Roman used to register the domain, and this was the first plate that was about to fall. The detective dug into the email records to find anything beyond credit card data, something or anything personal that would reveal Track 2's identity, and he found it right there in plain sight an email for a PayPal receipt listing Roman's name and his home address in Vladivostok. He even found a receipt for a bouquet that he sent to his wife. Roman was incredibly intelligent, but like many other intelligent people, he was also dumb enough to make incredibly stupid mistakes, such as making travel reservations through the server that contained all of his personal information, including his passport number the same server he was storing hundreds of thousands of fraudulent credit card numbers on. For a guy who was making his living off of unsecured networks, it didn't seem like Roman was taking any precautions at all to protect his own. Dawn now had exactly what he needed. The secret service was frothing at the mouth. This was the same man who had evaded justice before, and now they had him in the sights again, dead to rights. In 2011, Dunn went to a grand jury in the United States District Court of Washington and filed for an indictment. Bank fraud, possession and trafficking of stolen access devices, and several other crimes, along with his nine other aliases, were listed on the indictment. They would stop at nothing to bring Roman in this time, but a darker fate awaited him. While the Secret Service and Dunn scoured the globe looking for their man, tragedy struck Roman's life again. On April 28, 2011, the Roman and his wife were enjoying a vacation in Marrakesh, Morocco, and stopped for lunch at the popular Arganya Cafe. Then, at 11.50am, an Al-Qaeda affiliated terrorist set off two pressure-cooked bombs hidden inside a backpack. The blast killed 17 people and injured 25 more, and there, in the rubble, lay Roman, unconscious and barely breathing. Authorities flew him back home to Russia. In Moscow, doctors performed intensive surgeries to repair the head injuries he sustained from the explosion. Roman stayed in a coma for several weeks, as authorities on the other side of the world desperately tried to locate him. 
Now, what goes through your mind in that state? Would you be contemplating everything that took you to this moment? Would you think about the family you almost lost? What about the love of your life waiting for you to wake up? Roman had survived trauma before, but this was different. He suffered injuries that, according to him, would give him seizures for the rest of his life. Not only that, but his wife left him during the months of recovery, with them being officially divorced just a year later. The devastating blast shattered not only his body, but also his life. Obviously, while he was in a coma, his online trail also went cold. In 2012, his website went offline. One of his underlings even posted that activities were halted since his boss was in an accident. And at this time, conscious or not, as long as he remained in Russia, his country would never turn him over to American authorities. In the US, Detective Dunn was getting desperate. Through Roman's travel records, they found he would often fly through South Korea to get to his home in Indonesia. They worked with the authorities there to set up an extradition plan should Roman ever set foot in the country. But now awake, Roman randomly started booking direct flights, completely circumventing Dunn's plan. In fact, the authorities were pursuing a very different Roman Selesnev in Germany, almost arresting the wrong man for having the right name. While the details aren't available, there were even efforts to lure him into visiting Australia. But Roman seemingly stayed one step ahead of the authorities. After all, he'd now been given a second chance in life. And this time, would he still go back to his old ways? When he was almost caught before and saved by an inside connection, he still wasn't rich. But now, he had tens of millions of dollars, and if he just stayed in Russia, he was safe from any and all foreign authorities. He could just live in luxury and be completely protected. But if you've made it this far in the story, you know already that that was never an option. Now he was about to take his final form. In 2013, Roman started his brand new carding website, 2pack.cc, and this version was truly, truly outrageous. He freely advertised that this site had the best data around from credit card numbers to stolen gift cards. 2pack even offered 24-7 tech support. Yes, criminals had round-the-clock support for all their hacking needs. He had so much clout and respect in this digital underground space that other prominent hackers were coming to him to resell their stolen data. Roman was returning to his luxury lifestyle of island hopping, big boats, and fast cars. Not even a near-death experience or losing his family could stop him. I mean, why would it? All of his life, he kept getting away with every criminal act. No one could kill him. No cop could catch him. And this confidence made for good business. But it was also going to make him sloppy. When people were selling their data in large troves, it's called dumps. And Roman advertised on all the relevant forums that he could get the best prices for those dumps. And once again, this massive volume of data got the attention of the Secret Service. And this time, they had help. On July 1st, 2014, an anonymous tipster contacted the Secret Service with information. Roman Selesnev would soon be in the Maldives. There had been so many other attempts and close encounters with Roman, it almost became comical. Could the agents even trust this source? But what choice did they have? They had very few options to catch him otherwise, so the feds moved quickly on the tip. The Secret Service coordinated with the Department of Justice, the State Department, the Sri Lankan government, the Maldivian government, and even Russian diplomats to apprehend Roman. On July 3rd, Secret Service agents were on the ground in the tropical paradise, preparing to spring the trap. And just two days later, their patience finally, finally paid off. Roman and his entourage landed at the Marley International Airport in a private jet on July 5th, wrapping up a $20,000 resort vacation and now on his way back home to Russia. After he stepped off the plane, he was greeted with a warrant and a free trip to Guam instead, where he was detained in one of the harshest prisons on Earth. After evading authorities for over a decade, Roman was finally behind bars in US custody. He was later flown from his island jail cell to Washington State, where he would then await trial. Agents like Detective Dunn had studied his movements and accounts for so long that they knew his digital footprint and patterns. And they knew that despite Roman's tech-savvy nature, he wasn't the best at securing his data. He frequently used one of three passwords for every single one of his accounts. So when agents finally had his laptop in front of them, it took them only one try to guess his password 
and reveal all of the evidence within. The agents tapped in Ochako123 and immediately had access to all of his files, stolen data, passports and records of every transaction on his website. To make it worse, Roman, the hacker mastermind, didn't even bother to encrypt his data. And just so you know, in Russia, Ochako is slang for asshole. Roman's criminal empire fell apart in seconds because of his bizarre Freudian slip and laziness. The forensic experts searched through his hard drive and found 1.7 million credit card numbers. There was even a cheat sheet file that linked every one of Roman's accounts to his passwords. They even found instructions to his followers on how to steal dumps and store the data. He warned users that this process was illegal, yet still meticulously laid out every step. Roman Seleznev was indeed the Tony Robbins of credit card fraud, and now that he was found, everyone wanted a piece of him. In 2011, he was identified by Nevada prosecutors as part of a conspiracy for his carding activities. He faced charges in Atlanta, Georgia for the same crimes, and of course, there were the detailed crimes compiled by Detective Dunn and his Seattle unit. Despite the mountains of evidence on this hard drive, Roman declined the opportunity to make a plea deal. In his mind, there was still a way out of this mess, somehow. Enter Roman's father, a well-connected Russian politician. He wasn't present for his son as a child, so he was trying to make up for that failure now. This influential parliament member has close ties to none other than Vladimir Putin. Surely he could arrange something. The elder Seleznev chatted with his son over the prison phone lines and discussed a mysterious figure named Uncle Andrei, magicians, doctors, and fishing trips. Their word choices and language seemed like nonsense, until one exchange made their intentions exceedingly clear. From the transcript, Valerie was recorded saying, quote, what can we discuss, your escape plan, or what? The daring jailbreak never happened, but not for lack of trying. They flirted with the idea of witness tampering, still a no-go, but the two weren't done conspiring. From further transcripts, they moved on to the possibility of bribing the lead prosecutor with $10 million. Roman was so out of touch with reality that he thought that was the annual salary of a government lawyer. Maybe they weren't the best thought out plans, but Roman wasn't going down without a fight. His lawyer threw whatever he could at the wall, trying to make anything stick. He said the US abducted Roman, he claimed Roman suffered head injuries and was gravely ill from hepatitis B. According to his lawyer, Roman needed special medical attention that the US was unwilling or unable to provide. None of this, however, swayed the judge, and the trial moved forward. The defense had one more last second ploy. The lawyer claimed that the US government or another hacker had planted all that evidence on his laptop that there was an elaborate scheme to pin all of these cyber crimes and fraud on the very innocent family man. As pathetic as that attempt sounds, it was, unfortunately, a claim that had merit. The agents who apprehended Roman's laptop never once turned it off. That caused background programs and files to keep updating, and that means files the government claimed were Roman's were post-dated after his arrest. The defense argued there's no way those files could have existed with those dates unless they were planted. It wasn't much of a plan, but at least it was something. And the accusations were enough to make the prosecution need to prove their own innocence. Of course, it didn't take much for forensic computer experts to find event logs, shadow volume copies, and a Wi-Fi connection history, proving that the laptop was last used in the Maldives and that every file did in fact belong to Roman. In August 2016, Roman finally faced a jury of his peers to answer for his crimes. In a week and a half, the court was flooded with evidence establishing Roman's guilt. At least 400 victims were identified during the proceedings. Roman begged the judge for leniency and apologized for his crimes. Quote, I plead, pray, and beg your honor for mercy. Roman laid bare in front of everybody was not the same egotistical internet kingpin from only a few years ago. This was a broken man. The judge responded in no uncertain terms, stating that the bombing was quote, an invitation to right your wrongs and recognize you were given a second chance in life. The judge reminded Roman that instead, he had amassed a fortune at the expense of others and you were driven by one goal and one goal alone, greed. When the defense rested, it took the jury less than a few hours to return with a guilty verdict. Roman was then found guilty on 38 of 40 counts 
and sentenced to 27 years in custody. The defense called the sentence draconian, saying, quote, he will die in an American jail. At this point, Roman's attorney now asked if the plea deal was still on the table, to which the American government laughed at the idea. They had everything they needed from Roman, he'd lost his opportunity to negotiate, and to this day, Roman remains in custody in FCI Butner in North Carolina. Roman proved that not all hackers sat in the dark, hiding behind a screen. His criminal network is estimated to have cost financial institutions and businesses more than $169 million in damages. Some places like the Broadway Grill never recovered and were forced to close. And all that money was, to this date, never recovered. Ultimately, Roman was brought down by his hubris and lack of operational security. And with carding sites still prevalent and available online, it's only a matter of time until a new criminal fills his very large shoes. Unless, of course, they already have.